and welcome to the 19th meeting of the committee in 2019. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members who are using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they're turned to silent. We've received apologies today from Tavish Scott, MSP. Uh, Tavish has announced this week that he is standing down as an MSP um, and of course Tavish has been widely uh, recognised as a, a champion uh, of his constituency of the Shetland Isles which he has uh, represented I believe since 1999 um, and for his role as Minister in the Labour Lib Dem coalition um, in the past and uh, we've certainly benefited from his, uh, his constituency knowledge of uh, of fishing matters, particularly um, in our inquiries into Brexit. Um, and I would like to thank Tavish um, on behalf of all the members for his contribution uh, to the committee and to wish him well in the future. Our first item on the agenda today is an evidence session as part of the committee's <coughs> arts funding inquiry. And I would like to in, uh, welcome our panel of witnesses, uh, Leonie Bell, who is strategic lead with the Paisley Partnership of Renfrewshire Council. Gary Cameron, the Head of Place Partnerships and Communities with Creative Scotland. David MacDonald, the Arts Development Director of DG Unlimited. And Stuart Murdoch, the Director of Leisure and Culture in Dundee. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, the, the, the overarching theme of our session today is um, the relationship, um, the impo very important role and relationship that the local authorities uh, have with, uh, with culture and uh, I'd like you all come from different perspectives of course uh, and perhaps you could briefly explain the role of your organisations. Um, we could maybe start with Gary and, and work along. Right. Good morning, um, Gary Cameron, mm. Head of Place Partnerships and Communities at Creative Scotland. Creative Scotland is the national organisation which supports art, screen and creative industries. My specific role is to lead our engagement with local authorities. Um, I oversee the Place Partnership Programme, which is operating across 12 different areas in Scotland. Um, in addition to that, we work very closely with community groups and voluntary reg groups, um, attending funding fairs, community events, providing advice and guidance, um, whether that be on how to apply directly to Creative Scotland or how to develop a project or seek funding from elsewhere. Prior to joining Creative Scotland, I worked in local government um, as an arts officer and then arts official um, for around 10 years. So I'm reflecting on a perspective from a national um, and my experience at the local level. Hi. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm in a relatively new role at Renfrewshire Council. So my job's called Strategic Lead Paisley Partnership, but it's very much born from the UK City of Culture bidding process, which Paisley didn't win, but still deem as a success in that it's given us an understanding as a local authority and how important culture is to the future of Paisley and wider Renfrewshire. So my job is to really position culture strategically within a council context, but also develop wider local community partnerships, national partnerships and international partnerships. Good morning. So I'm coming from Dundee, where I've been on the management team since it was set up previously as a director for communities and parks, and now in the role of leisure and culture. And in 2011-12, Dundee set up the first SCIO, which is an ALIO, delivering our leisure arts and cultural provision in the city. So I have the twin role <clears throat> of being part of the City Council's management team and uh, advising the Council on policy relating to leisure arts and culture, but also the managing director for the arm's length body, the ALIO, uh, Leisure and Culture, Dundee. And I'm uh, David MacDonald, Arts Development Director of uh, DG Unlimited. Um, we're a small organisation. Uh, we uh, have three part-time freelance staff and we're a membership organisation um, that works with and provides a voice for the cultural sector of Dumfries and Galloway. Um, we seek to create uh, Scotland's leading, leading rural arts network um, by supporting creative practitioners and organisations to help themselves and help each other. Um, providing the collective voice and celebrating and nurturing talent and growing the next generation of artists. Um, we have uh, a network of over 440 members and our membership consists of predominantly practitioners, um, cultural administrators and some people that are a small minority that would call them supporters of the arts. Um, we were established in 2012 and we're a legacy of Creative Scotland's Place Partnership Programme. Thank you very much. Um, David, could you maybe say a little more about, um, my understanding is that the, 
the way you operate is quite unique in Scotland. It's always a grand claim, isn't it, unique? <laughs> but I think we are a bit, uh, a little bit different, or hopefully bring something different to the cultural ecology of Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, I guess, um, go, I guess we're the result of uh, what you could call a, a perfect storm. Um, back in 2011, the DG Arts Association um, ceased trading, and at the time, they were the only. Um, regularly funded organisation south of the central belt in, in Scotland. And um, th that sort of coincided with um, a period of restructuring within the local authority and there was no one at a, really at a strategic level and management level sort of making decisions on arts development. Uh, and this coincided at a time when Creative Scotland were launching their place partnership programme across Scotland and Dumfries and Galloway was one of the first cohorts. So Croke Scotland started to engage in conversations with the local authority uh, within this sort of uh, uh, strategic hiatus that was currently existing at the time. Um, and through uh, funding from LEADER, the Council and Creative Scotland, uh, uh, there was a, a quite an extensive and intensive sort of a engagement process that took place with the cultural sector uh, that led to a, a report called Fresh Start for the Arts. And one of those um, uh, recommendations from that report was actually the, the establishment of an organisation uh, that we know now as DG Unlimited or DGU. So uh, uh, we are a membership organisation and um, so our board it comes from our membership um, and we have a service level agreement with the local authority and, and effectively we provide advice and guidance on arts development for the local authority and we um, uh, also support them in the del delivery of a, a fund called the Regional Arts Fund across the region. So it's a way that the local authority can actually uh, capture the voice of the sector in some decision making around arts and culture in the region. Okay, that's interesting for our committee, given that we're, we're looking. One of the themes is how we can uh, how we can do more to support practitioners and, and cultural freelancers. And obviously, the um, the approaches right across Scotland have been variable. The, 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 um, in terms of how culture is supported, uh, variable both in the the way that different areas approach it, but also the funding uh, that goes into arts right across uh, Scotland. Do you think that, that that variety and the fact that some uh, local areas are spending a lot less than, than others is a result of arts funding not being a statutory requirement for local authorities? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, it's the, and we now have a national outcome for creativity culture, which is um, really welcome. You know, and, uh, There is a, a worry that perhaps that may be, be too late. There are some local authorities who have... Uh, been had the difficult position to make decisions on their budgets and sometimes the arts has been the one that's cut um, but um, you know the, uh, you know I, you know obviously I, I would say that um, you know what we got to look at is actually the, the contribution that the arts makes across a wider society in terms of impact and social neural sort of like individuals communities cohesion community development learning confidence um, health uh, preventive spend in terms of social justice uh, criminal justice and um, health care um, but perhaps it's about actually you know um, what we perhaps need to do is actually uh, make the case stronger, find a way to make the case stronger. I, I, Crate Scotland is sort of like to some extent sort of lost its sort of uh, powers of research. Um, it, it, you know, and it, I guess we, we would as a sector would benefit from more strategic positioning papers on culture and arts and its impact and its reach across um, wider society. If our national body for the arts is unable to sort of lead on a research function and that, I wonder who else might do that. Does anyone else want to come in on this issue of arts that's not being a statutory requirement and what impact that has, Stuart? Well, <clears throat> um, I've always said it's, it's statutory, it's not mandatory. 
And I think the distinction is that we couldn't do it as a local authority if it wasn't statutory, but it's not mandatory. And the issue for us is with ring fencing, particularly for, for education and other aspects of Scottish Government um, policy as it impacts locally, what's left for investment in arts and culture and quality of life expenditure has definitely been under pressure for the last five years. So for five years, you've got the data. The data locally in Dundee is, is horrible to look at in a city that really values it. So there's, no, there's never been any dispute about the impact, interestingly. So while research is really needed, absolutely needed, in our case, it's purely the mechanism of budget setting that mitigates against funding for the arts. And that, that's in a city that has put um, culture-led regeneration right at the centre of its strategic policies. You know, the V&A in Dundee, the investment in Dundee, you, you, you all know about. So I'm fortunate to work in a place that really values it at a community level, at a neighbourhood level, at a cross-party level. That doesn't protect it. So my argument would be, if there is to be ring fencing, then, and I don't know if there should be, but if there is and there is, um, then there should be, within that ring, funding for art as part of the wider portfolio of Scottish Government outcomes, and it's not. We're outside the ring, and that's where we're disadvantaged. Leonie? Yeah, I mean, next year, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if being stuck, I think, you know, the word adequate, I think, is in current sort of documents, and what does adequate provision of libraries of culture mean? I think there's bigger questions we need to ask ourselves about the role that culture and creativity have more broadly in trying to get us to the sort of country we want to be, the sort of communities we want to have, the sort of places we want to have, and very much like Dundee, Paisley is using culture to define its future through cultural regeneration. So we're finding a framework in which we can inhabit to then leave our other, other funding by doing that. But it's about getting, I suppose, our vision and our collective ambition right first. So we're doing that locally, but nationally, I guess that's where we need to be doing it as well. And I think there's other issues with kind of the ideas around statutory and mandatory, which are then you and sort of there'll be people maybe listening into this that won't want me to get anywhere close to definitions of culture so early on a, on a sunny day, but how do you then define what it is you're making mandatory and whose culture is that and where does it happen and all those sorts of things? And I think they're very real and serious questions for us. Um, and so I suppose the more kind of rules you put around it, I think the more you can also sort of free, freeze it in a way. I think it's more about how do we get to a country a place, a sort of policies and strategies in the country where actually we're not thinking about how to be greener, how to respond to climate change, how to think about a progressive education system, a, you know, an inclusive economy without actually having culture at the heart of that. That's where we need to be looking. We need to stop looking at siloed budgets and thinking broadly and in an intersectional way across the budgets that we have and in terms of policy development. But I think it has to start with the ambition, the strategy, the policy. Then you look at the budget mechanisms. Otherwise, I think we'll just be kind of... I suppose, moving bits of the same problems around within the existing system and we possibly need to start extending our view to a societal view when we're thinking about culture, not just within the cultural sector, if that, if that makes sense. Gary, you've seen it, like, obviously not, not every local authority has signed up for the place partnerships. Would making culture a statutory requirement change that, do you think? I think it would be helpful. Um, I think there's, I'd agree with the, the kind of the semantic around statutory. I think what's absent is the active consideration of culture and how it can contribute. So the positive aspects that you have been touched on, you know, to people's lives, to bringing people together, or to the economy, it's not a statutory consideration. So, for example, within community planning, Creative Scotland is not a statutory partner, and that, in my opinion, should be. Um, so the, actually the points at which um, different groups are getting together um, to consider what are the priorities for that region, developing their local outcome improvement plans, it's variable where culture is even represented in those discussions. So the ability for culture to be even considered as a potential priority is not statutory. Okay, thanks very much. And one of the things that we've done as part of this inquiry is to commission research from Drew Wiley into how things work in other parts of Europe. And one of the things that struck us from the research was that um, quite often in other parts of Europe there is a there is a structure put in place, there's an agreement put in place between central and local government in terms of how arts and culture is, is delivered across those countries. I know that that is something that Creative Scotland has been exploring and government's been exploring. Do you think that would help to have some kind of formal arrangement in place? 
think it could be helpful. I think we would need to develop a solution that was correct for Scotland. Uh, but you're right, we have looked at it. Um, the Irish Arts Council visited, and it was a session with different local authorities to explain how it does in Ireland. We're aware of the Swedish model. I think the first step would be to get the, the, the principle in place that, to invite local authorities to be mandated to plan for culture, to articulate what their priorities are. And I think that's the first step in other countries has been, is to make sure, as in the case in France as well, that there, there is a requirement for them to have a cultural strategy to show how they are considering how culture, and then to consider how Create Scotland and other national bodies can collaborate to help deliver that. So that's the first step that's been taken in other countries. And I think if we can get to that, then certainly closer and more formal uh, arrangements between local and national could, could be very helpful. Anyone else want to come in on that? Like, like David was saying, if it's about using what we already have, so we do have an outcome for, for culture now, and that is, is positive, but it could be that we're not doing enough around it. There is the National Performance Framework. I don't think anybody would argue with anything in it. It clearly sets out how to be a better Scotland across a number of cross-cutting areas, but as far as I'm aware, sitting within the local authority that I'm in, we, we bear it in mind, but there isn't necessarily a, a structure around how we report on it. We're very interested in culture and what it can bring, bring to us as a local authority, but I think it's more that local government is bearing those outcomes in mind. It can't be expected to necessarily be delivering fully across all of them. So maybe there's a bit of work around that outcome and how you then develop the relationships or the framework around that, rather than creating another, another system and set of agreements and structures, because we're all quite, there's quite a burden of those at the moment, I think, within local government and certainly within the wider cultural sector that nobody wants to add to that. So we'd look at what we've already got, outcome is a positive thing, but let's make more of, more of that. And it also gets us what we want in terms of very long-term strategic outcome-focused working across policy and across sectors, which should be good, I think. If, if I may, just uh, the one thing that Dundee has done, uh, it's available online, I should perhaps send it to you, it has maintained a cultural strategy since there was government guidance about having Scottish government guidance about putting in place a cultural strategy. So that has helped us. The, the point of reporting for the cultural strategy is to the Dundee partnership, the local community planning partnership for the city. So for in excess of uh, 15 years, we've, we've been reporting to the community planning partnership on the strategic decisions and with an action plan. There's no security for that, and that's why it's not common across Scotland. But I think it has been really helpful to have that focus, uh, which is reported both to the Council and to it, its strategic partners. Um, Gary's point about the location of Creative Scotland, we would really welcome um, that. We've, we've always had Creative Scotland as a, an advisor and a partner, but I think to have them as a statutory partner and there as of right would be helpful. Thank you. Um, Tom Priest and Galloway Council are just in the process of creating a cultural strategy and um, w we're on part of that uh, project team. Um, so um, we're bringing the voice of the, uh, the, uh, the region's creative sector into that process. So that's going to kick off in a couple of weeks' time. Um, so, um, and uh, I just sort of, more broadly speaking, I just wonder if sort of, um, I wonder if there's a way to look at things completely differently, perhaps. I mean, Create Scotland, partly due to its legislation that has formed the organisation, sort of, it's in that really difficult position where it's maybe perhaps trying to be all things to all people, you know, sort of um, uh, public benefit, artistic excellence. And I just wonder whether there's a, this is the time as part of this process to explore, you know, there's, there are various sort of like avenues for funding and interests in culture broadly, not just from the National Body of the Arts, not just from local authorities, but there's actually what, perhaps what focus, you know, does local authorities focus on their citizens and visitors of the region, allowing Creative Scotland to uh, look at international export of our talent and um, growing excellence at home? And just, is there a different way to, a different lens to look at um, funding of culture through? Okay, thank you. Stuart, was your, uh, was your supplementary on this topic? Yes. Yes, no. please. Uh, thank you. Just one question for Mr Cameron that you mentioned a few moments ago regarding uh, wanting to be, uh, Creative Scotland to be a, a statutory consultee. Uh, does Creative Scotland actually have the capacity uh, to be a statutory consultee across all 32 local authority areas? Uh, yes, um, I think it would be a challenge. It would require us to think about how we work. Um, but I personally, I think it's very important, and I think considering how we can develop that capacity, um, so yes. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah. Bold, good. <laughs> um, Claire. Um, thank you, convener. Um, I suppose there's two ways to approach this. We, there was a parliamentary question um, answered in spring this year about the amount of funding that goes to local authorities, the amount that local authorities spend on culture. And over the whole of Scotland, we see a 2.7% reduction from 2016 through to 2018. Uh, that would be a real, that would be bigger in real terms. I only have the net figures, I don't have the real term figures. And there is some variations between local authorities, but ones that are spending more, it's, it's not a significant amount more. And again, once you interpret it into real terms, I'd imagine it's either a very small increase or there's a reduction there again. So we've already talked a bit about the pressures on local government funding and culture not being statutory, so it's not getting the level of protection that other areas are. And a solution to this, I suppose you either increase the amount of money that goes to local authorities, um, or you give local authorities more power to raise more revenue themselves. There's then a question which we're going to be doing through the tourist tax, if local authorities decide to take that up, and the committee's already looked at that. Um, there's the debate around workplace parking. So there's other areas opening up for local authorities, but it's, does any of that money the intention that any of that money would go to culture, would that be a priority area? Or I suppose the other way you approach it is what you've talked about already this morning. You look at a cultural strategy, you look at putting a structure in place that emphasises the importance of culture and local authorities don't have a choice but to invest in it. So I actually want to reflect a bit on how, the, how we might resolve some of the larger funding issues, just about the amount that actually goes to local authorities and whether it is about trying to increase that amount um, or is it about the way in which they distribute the money that they have. Um, and also maybe you can comment on the draft cultural strategy. So that has a process that's been going on uh, for a wee while now. Uh, we're not clear when the strategy will be published. And I'd be interested to know if you think the strategy will be able to address some of these issues and provide that level of, um, whether it's direction or commitment to the arts and provide an expectation there that there needs to be delivery on this policy area. So it's quite a lot of questions. Well, Leone, I'm looking at you. <laughs> so, OK, <laughs> what I didn't say in my introduction about my job is that my previous experience is obviously working as Head of Culture Strategy within the Scottish Government and as Director of Arts at Creative Scotland. So I've got uh, lots of reference points and experiences I can bring to this. So I'll maybe go backwards if it's OK with your questions. So the draft culture strategy. Um, you know, I think what we wanted to do with it is encourage a society-wide national debate about the importance of culture to our future. As a country, I think it did do that. I think it got it was complicated. I, you know, I have to really be very honest about that. It, when you start to think about things societally and not within the, the sort of structure of their own sector, it becomes it becomes complicated. But I think that's still where we need to keep pursuing the draft culture strategy. So, I think, in, to be brief, if society is flourishing, I think the culture sector flourishes too. So, um, as the chair was saying earlier, if there's things like universal basic income that are being introduced in Scotland, they will make a really big difference to artists and creative freelancers as well. So, it's not the answers aren't just within the sector that we're we're talking about. You know, it's a it's a broader thing. But yeah, I, I agree. I don't I don't know when the draft culture strategy is coming out now. I've not I've not been there for six months, but I do think that actually taking time with it is okay. It might be frustrating, but I don't think the work will be undone that was done nationally around it. I think it's maybe okay to pause with it because of the important work you're doing here. And I know that Creative Scotland are also out and about having lots of conversations about the role of funding and not just the mechanisms of funding, but what public funding means as a strategic lever that we, that we have. So yeah, I do think the strategy, we have to have a hope that the cultural strategy will carry some of the work that this committee is doing and other work forward. And I think make a really bold move around, and I've said it already, that you cannot become the greener, fairer, inclusive, economic, progressive, open to the world country we want to be unless we place culture and creativity at the heart of that. So if that's an ideological aim, you then have to think about the structures that we've got by which we can kind of work towards that and everything is very siloed. And the more that we're under fiscal and financial pressures, the more siloed we become because you retreat, you retreat into your own territories. We all do that. It's, it's human nature, so you've got to have a collective, you know, society-wide ambition to kind of carry people forward. So like you, when I was doing the, the strategy work, we spent a lot of time um, looking for answers in other places internationally. And there's some amazing things that happen around the world, but there's all, and there's some amazing things that happen around the UK and Scotland and, and in closer sort of UK neighbours as well. But then you come back to Scotland's quite peculiar devolved 
position around some things and you kind of hit a bit of a barrier. So you hit a bit of a barrier around welfare or kind of tax levers and all those things. So you still have to try and always find your find your way forward. Um, and there is things to be learning from other places, absolutely. So Germany, for example, do a really simple thing within their welfare system. If you're applying for public funding as an artist, you can use the application process as job seeking points. In effect, you're not being penalised. You can retain your, your welfare. But Scotland can't do that. That's a UK power power still. So we were looking at all of all of those things. But Finland was interesting to us. We looked at how people budget and the values and principles that they apply to their budgeting processes. And it, when you look at a country like Finland, I think we would all expect to see a, a culture budget that's high nationally and locally. But actually, it's not. I can't remember the exact figures, so forgive me for not having them. But it's not as high as we thought compared to Scandinavian neighbours. But then you look beneath the surface a little bit, and what you see is that culture budgets sit in all, all budgets within the, the Finnish kind of government. So it's in environment and climate change, it's in early years. It's, it's not just in how they budget, it's within how they think about the communities and the country that they're supporting and, and developing. And I still think that's where we need to put our, our long-term energy. It doesn't maybe fix the immediate problems. That's where the strategy was trying, trying to go. Um, other questions you raised there, again, they're really complicated about other kind of how do you get councils to raise more money. Alios were brought in as a means by to doing that as well. Some of it works, some of it is, is quite challenging for us. I think the tourism tax will work for some places potentially. It might not work for Paisley yet. Maybe one day it will, but, you know, we're not in that place yet. And I have a feeling that the heat around a tourism tax in a city like Edinburgh, there'll be so many people after bits of that. Again, how do we do what Gary was saying and kind of make sure that... Um, to use a bit of a, I know you were talking about pies and cakes last time, and going back to kind of the, the food metaphor, we're still always on the menu, and we need to be at the really high level strategic table as well, so that we're informing how the earliest decisions are made and the earliest policies are being developed to make sure that if a tourism tax does come in embedded within that, is the ability for it to then support culture in the places where the tourism tax is going to is going to work. Um, but I think it's really about trying to work out what the levers we have as a national government and local government, how we bring them together to kind of look at how you get more money. And I think nobody's sitting on this panel thinking that there's more money coming quick, but I still think it would be a good ambition for us to work towards getting more money into the culture budget overall, because it is such an efficient way of getting so much for this country. And I agree about making the case, but I think we make it to the same people again and again, and we've got to start making it to different people. Sorry, that was quite a long answer, but it was quite a lot of complicated questions there, so forgive me. Well, I have a go at it. <laughs> um, so I think at the heart of this is, 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 is how the cake is cut. And I think the debate that Leonie refers to about embedding it um, across public sector delivery, as opposed to having a discrete ring-fenced budget for culture, is really interesting. So in a city like Dundee, the percentage of our local authority expenditure on culture is less than 3%, and yet it's our silver bullet. More was invested by government in the Pupil Equity Fund in one year than is invested in culture. So the, you, if the government took a decision to go in this direction, it could do it and has done it. And I think that's the question for me. It's, it, we will all face the, the, the tail end of austerity, the, the kind of financial pressures that we face. In a local authority where money is ring-fenced, where political direction and focus is on priority areas, unless culture is protected in some way, either by the way in which it's embedded across or by ring-fencing it, that, that's, it's, there's not enough, I don't think, being invested. If we ask people in the city um, how much they think of their taxation or their public pound is spent on culture, they're pretty shocked when they hear it's less than 3%. They're assuming in a city like Dundee, with the V&A and with the rep and with the, the, the leisure and culture facilities, they, if you ask people in the street, they will say, what must be about, is it 10%? It it's not, it's a, it's a third of that. So the level of investment, as, it, as it's currently kind of counted and visible, is quite small. If I was confident uh, that by reinvesting it across other areas, it would be a return to the development of artists and artistic production and the creative and cultural sector, I'd be relaxed about that. Where I'm, I'm less relaxed is the Finnish model. They've embedded it, they believe in it, they're committed to it, it's transversal, and it delivers. In my experience, the money that's going into other sectors, because of the very pressures that Leon is referring to that they're under, it tends to be siphoned into what they see as their 
first priority and the cultural investment tends to, to drop down. So while education could choose through pupil equity fund or mainstream funding to invest more in its cultural partners, its very focus on the attainment and achievement agenda, of course, drives them back to what is what they're primarily judged against. And we're judging people against measures that I think this panel would probably question are the right measures. I suppose linked to that, just as a final question, is, is about the national um, outcome, which you've referred to um, a bit already. So the indicators and the performance um, indicators we have for local authorities, do you think those are the right ones? Are they, from what I've heard this morning, it, it sounds like there's, I don't know how effective they are in driving the work at local authority level. Um, and I think you know, Leone and Stuart have both made arguments for the recognition of culture within other budgets. And I think that is what, partly what Fiona Hislop is trying to do with the cultural strategy, though we don't know when that's going to appear. I just have a bit of concern we're quite far away from that. It's a message we've heard from other panels. We're quite far away from getting to the stage where that becomes any kind of reality or becomes meaningful. We've heard about pockets of activity, maybe where some funding of NHS money goes to a particular project, but there doesn't seem, we seem quite far away from having anything more substantial when it comes to the way in which money is spent and done by departments and the amount that goes to culture. So maybe I should want to comment briefly on the national outcome performance indicators, whether they're where we need to go, whether they're strong enough and how they need to be improved or... Sorry, shall I give it, give it a go? Um, I, think they're, I think they're good and I think they're strong enough. I think it's what we then do, do with them. I don't, I need, I've only been in local government a few months, so, so forget this, this wrong. Apologies to, to, to colleagues. But as far as I understand it, um, we're, we're, we've, we're aware of the national outcomes across all areas and the indicators that sit under them. But, and obviously the, the kind of community planning and the, the local planning groups that we've got set up around that are the means by which we do it. And you can't deliver any of those national outcomes without massively mobilising local government to deliver them. That's going to be the main mechanism by which those outcomes are achieved for this country, through local government action. But what I don't think currently exists is any formalised structure around how we all report on that, therefore how you get a complete aggregated national view of what those outcomes and performance indicators are achieving, if that makes, if that makes sense. And I think trying to achieve that aggregated, big picture view of all of them is important. I'm not yet sure how we get that. So I think probably through work, obviously with COSLA and others, maybe there's still something to be done about working. We would obviously, we'll, bear, we'll bear a lot of attention to the cultural one because we're setting our stall by it as a local government. We're, you know, like Dundee and a few others, we've been hugely ambitious around culture for Paisley and wider Renfrewshire, but I don't think there's a structure to support it. We will do it because we've already d identified it as a strategic priority. So if you haven't done that, I think you could just not report on the culture one. I think, I think that's the situation at the moment. I don't think it's formalised and structured. I think it's just what you choose to, to, to do around it. Is that right? I think that's probably yeah. similar. I mean, we, we used to have it as one of the strategic themes of the Dundee partnership. And the advice from government, which I think was very sound, was to try and have fewer themes. And so economic, children's services, community safety came to the fore as, as the strategic themes and culture became a kind of cross-cutting theme, uh, as did environment, actually, as well. You could argue that both of those are really, really important. But the way that you cut the cake, the way that you divide the strategic with the transversal is really challenging. Um, I think it's been downgraded. I think in recent years, um, in my experience, the profile given to reporting on cultural, cultural sectors' impact on national outcomes, not just the, the specific one, but across the board, has become less high profile. And that's something that the committee, that the, the government could make more demands on. And I, I would welcome that. Um, at a local level, what I would say, which is interesting, is the way that funded organisations, whether they're funded by Creative Scotland or the partnership funding with the local authority, the ALIO, we all will report on the national outcomes. So if you go into the theatre or to the Contemporary Arts Centre or to the library service, they are, they are mindful, they're reporting on, and they're looking at the national outcomes as a frame, a frame of reference against which they should judge their performance locally. Um, I just wonder whether uh, the national, the current performance indicators on the outcome would match actually the ambition of the 
draft culture strategy for Scotland. You know, obviously I'm horizon scanning here. None of us know what that will look like. But if the ambition that's described in the, uh, the draft now about seeking a step change in how society values and views culture and the transformational uh, power of culture has, I think maybe the current uh, indicators are, are more sort of empirical, so they'll measure uh, stats and numbers, which is uh, of value and of use. But I just wonder whether it would get into the real texture and meaning of culture and the impact it can have across wider society. Um, we've been taking part in the, the South of Scotland's um, Economic Partnership, as you will know, have been doing the consultation uh, ahead of the agency being formed next April. Uh, and some of the feedback uh, that's come through uh, that process is actually the the agency will be open to different ways of measuring sort of like um, arts and culture and its contribution to the economy. I mean, that's yet to be determined what that might look like, but in cert certainly in terms of the conversation that's going on out of that process, they recognise that culture has um, a, a, another offer to make um, uh, to, to, to society in that respect. Yeah. Yes, but just wondering, because it's all officers who are here this morning, how important is political leadership? Or how important is it you have a councillor who understands the importance of culture? Sometimes you see that, you see a council that has a champion, someone who understands uh, how important um, culture is and can argue for that. So while you might have strategies put in place and it's all officer-led, it's still ultimately a political decision. I don't, you might not want to comment on that, but how... <laughs> <laughs> I can draw on my own experience, and I think I think it is very important. Um, I think it's also important that it's not just one individual that culture has a voice within the committee structure at a local authority level. So their issues are given sort of due discussion and due consideration. So some local authorities, for example, have a culture and sport subcommittee which will specifically focus on those issues. I think that's really important. I think the point on officers, I think it's it's equally important that there's a, a value and a discussion with, with those that are not engaged in the cultural activity. So it's discussion with colleagues, whether they work in health, planning, and that, in, in addition to creating structures that allow that to happen, it's about sort of having that discussion, changing ways of working. And I'm sure colleagues here have, I, I know, work extensively to engage colleagues in different departments. So politically and across officer level um, are both important, in my opinion. Um, Alexander. Can I go on to the, the PLACE programme itself and the funding that you have? Because as a number of organisations, you are, have been recipients of some of that. Uh, and can I maybe ask about what your experiences have been of that? Uh, is it working as you anticipated it to? Uh, have there been some difficulties? Are there any ways that it could be improved? Uh, and what your views are on, on, on it going forward? Well, I, we were one of the early ones, I was um, Dumfries and Galloway. I would say it was, almost without question, one of the most flexible, helpful and developmental funding programmes that I've been associated with. I would give it, you know, straight aces. It's, it was excellent. So we were able to form a partnership at the time that Dundee had been bidding to become the UK capital of culture. We formed a partnership at that time. Um, we didn't become the UK capital of culture as you know, uh, but uh, the legacy of that was a strong basis, uh, a revised and refreshed cultural strategy, and we had no obvious funding mechanism for delivering that, for driving it forward. And uh, Place Partnership was that mechanism. Had we not had that funding source, I hate to think what would have happened in Dundee in the, as a legacy of a failed bid. So Place Partnership allowed the University of Dundee to sustain a level of funding and a secondment, significant investment. The University of Aberdeen to, to, to have a secondment and some funding, uh, the City Council and the Legend Culture Trust. So we have four partners that matched the 250,000, Guy will keep me right, that was put up by uh, Creative Scotland. So we immediately uh, doubled it and then we doubled it again through the programmes they delivered. And it delivered for us over the last four years a cultural strategy. Where I'm going with this is it was great, but it stops. And it's a, it's a hard landing. And, and we've worked really hard to try and keep the partners' commitment to place partnership. I mean by that, City Council under its financial pressures, the Leisure and Culture Trust 
which ran a deficit of the last two years, its financial pressures, the universities under financial pressures. So they're saying, well, if we're not getting anything back from government, why should we put in our bit? Uh, and we've managed to persuade them for another three years to stick with the level of investment that they put in during the place partnership. But I think there's a real question there about the incentivising of investment in culture-led regeneration. It's been great. Yeah. Yeah. Similar. Well, similar, similar but different, um, in that we're, we're just kind of starting out. Although we've had the agreement um, with Creative Scotland um, for a, a, a while, it's taken us a little bit of time to get it right. So it became part of the bid process, again, which we didn't become UK City of Culture either. But, you know, that doesn't stop any of, any of, any of us with this. And the Place Partnership's been really, really important. And again, so from what we're then calling our bid legacy money, we've put 200k in, it's matched by... Creative Scotland and what it's enabling us to do really importantly, like actually, you know, following the work of this committee is so interesting because there's so much kind of chat about national and local. But when you get down to local level, you get local and local chat as well. And though they're real challenges for local local government. And what the place partnership is enabling us to do is to work really locally within neighbourhoods and communities and towns and villages as well as Paisley across um, Renfrewshire. It's run by Renfrewshire Leisure, our, our alio with responsibility for leisure and culture in the in the area and the other thing that's really important is that sits within I think your overarching place partnership program is a uh, something called VACMA which is visual arts and craft and makers awards and it's run for a number of years and it's not by any stretch of the imagination the biggest funding pot within Creative Scotland but it is so important it's awards of around 500 to 1500 pounds it's again partnered from Creative Scotland and local authority and it's a swift and efficient and transparent funding program that gets money directly into the hands of makers and artists living in the area some of which aren't visible to big national funding programs because they just can't get into them and that's really important so it's that really specific low-level detailed work that is so important for us in Renfrewshire means we can work uh, comprehensively across the whole local authority area learn from Creative Scotland as we do it I think they learn from us as we do it absolutely though echo Stewart's points about ring fence funds generally there's a national trend at the moment around ring fence funds across everything <coughs> education culture where, you know, they're, they're everywhere, they can be great, they can be exciting, but they also can be really short term. So they leave you with like, oh, what's, what do we do now? And actually, I think it's the match funding, it's the partnership of both bringing to the table or multiple bringing to the table that matters. So we maybe need to think about the phase two of place partnerships, what happens when you're on your, your, your last year of it and those sorts of things. But overall, it's a really, really good, really good programme. It just needs to maybe evolve a little bit, yeah. I would say. I would echo um, both what Leone and Stuart have said. Uh, for us, it's, um, it came at um, a real critical time, uh, strategically across the region. So it ga actually gave the council officers the evidence that they needed to take to committee to secure the strategic arts budget at the time, which uh, has been secured at the same level up until last year, where there was a small cut. So that's a really big success. The process itself is been really flexible, really open. Probably, for me, one of the most significant uh, initiatives coming out of the National Body for the Arts for quite some time, the Place Partnership Programme is a really exciting programme because it creates a different type of conversation with local authorities. It is about getting that conversation right though, because in our example, it, we had, it, it actually enabled to lock in some uh, local authority money as well but um, if that conversation wasn't right then the uh, local authority could potentially use that as an excuse to not fund the arts because there's other money coming in phase two is really important because there is a sudden sort of there is a sudden stop as Stuart said um, I, I don't I, um, and I feel actually I, I was quite sort of uh, Gary made a bubble snake like staff yes we can absolutely you know have that capacity to have those relationships across uh, the country. I just wonder whether Creative Scotland really has that capacity. And I think actually what the place partnerships is creates a, a different relationship where Creative Scotland can establish a network of partners where as those partners working locally can help Creative Scotland achieve its ambitions for the country. I think you know, you've identified that there's real potential here, but not every local authority has got involved. And in previous evidence, we did hear uh, that there was some criticism 
uh, of Creative Scotland not being sufficient resource or capacity to actually achieve and support all local authorities. So it would be good to get a view on that because, as I say, that, that, that has been a, a genuine uh, criticism about the organisation not having that. Uh, and we've already heard that others who are getting that opportunity see that as a real benefit, uh, uh, but uh, it only goes so far uh, and they need the link between Creative Scotland to make it work. Uh, and if that's not available or that's not resourced properly, then there are potential difficulties going forward. I think that's um, fair comment. Just on the, the reaching out across 32 in response to Mr McMillan, that was in, in terms of uh, being a statutory consultee for um, community planning. I think as a national organisation, we do have a responsibility to work across all 32 regions. Um, I think we do. Um, I think um, looking beyond the place partnership programme, whether it's target funds, youth music initiative, uh, cash back for creativity, visual arts and craft makers, work, as well as our open and regular funding. But we can do more, and um, colleagues who have sat before you before have acknowledged that. Um, so we can do more. But it's not just about Creative Scotland, but it's about how we work collaboratively. And that's the, a way of working that we need to develop, is how can we work collaboratively? So you've heard very positive examples today through the Place Partnership Programme, but the principle there is that it's a partnership. The owner, it's, not, it's not beholden on Creative Scotland to imply that they, that, you know, that they know what's best for that locality. It comes from the local, and that's a way of working. Um, it's challenging. You've heard very positive cases here today, but I'm sure each would tell you some of the difficulties in bringing people together. Other parts of Scotland, you know, it has been challenging. But we can do more, and I'm sure um, as we work through our organisational development, we'll think about different ways. And that principle of working in partnership with local partners has to be central. And you've talked about the political champion as well within the organisation. I think that's quite critical as well, if there is an org individual uh, within the organisation that has that capacity. But also uh, making sure that the, the players who are in the partnership are the ones who can bring something to the table. And you've talked about today some of the big players that you have within yeah. your communities that make a massive impact, that have the opportunity to develop that potential uh, and bring things forward. Uh, but if you don't have that capacity, it must be very difficult to break through. Uh, because if you don't have them sitting at the table uh, and bringing that resource and that support mechanism, then it must be very, very difficult. And that's maybe why some local authorities have found it uh, a challenge uh, to, to achieve their goal. Yep. On that, just I mean, I think the, what we are heading towards is where does the leadership for culture reside, and I think it, in it, in it, we've been very fortunate. I am absolutely aware of that, having worked other parts of Scotland. That in Dundee, you've got we've had a consensus political leadership over a number of administration over, over many years, decades, and we've also had a consistency of, of officer support at chief executive and senior officer level. When I have contact with other colleagues in other parts of Scotland. If you don't have that, the point you're making is that it's very difficult to kickstart it. What I wonder in terms of Creative Scotland's presence, and I'm referring now to our experience of working with Sports Scotland, where they have a regional presence, and it may be not every local authority, but perhaps some um, sense, and I hope Gary and his colleagues will forgive me for suggesting it, but I think having some sense of regional presence, um, which in effect we've had but not uh, as a kind of conscious structural decision in Dundee. So we've had good links with Creative Scotland because of the people who live there and who we've worked with. That has been powerful and it's been helpful. And if that could be extended, even to the point of having a regional presence as Sports Scotland is doing through its sports partnerships, I think that would help. Thank you, Convener. You're not the first person to say that in the course of this inquiry, um, particularly when we were out and about. Um, people said, why doesn't Creative Scotland have a, a regional presence? So um, that's definitely a, a strong theme that's coming through. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, uh, convener, and good morning, um, uh, panel. Uh, a lot of the discussion has, has been about local authorities because of the £560 million that went into the sector of 2017-18. It's obviously uh, fundamental to culture. And, but what I'm interested in, in looking at is the huge disparity in terms of funding across Scotland. So if we look at the figures from 17-18, um, there was a 2.75% decrease across the sector. But what that masked, if we look at the figures for the 32 authorities, was that while West Lothian had a shocking 19.8% decrease in funding, uh, Stirling's went up by 11.72%. Um, to over 10 million in Stirling's case. And looking, drilling down into these figures, I noticed that seven councils had above inflation increases, 
25 below inflation increases. But if we look at it on a per capita basis, Glasgow's is three times that of Edinburgh's, which is the lowest per capita in Scotland. Uh, Clickmanninshire is 50% higher per capita than Edinburgh, for example. Maybe Edinburgh can uh, attract private funding, etc., and other sources. So the, the, what I'm getting at here is you, you, you're looking to perhaps have a culture embedded in local government in Scotland and, or possibly ring fencing. But the, the issue with that, surely, is what kind of baseline would we start from? Because if we're talking about some local authorities, the baseline would be quite small, whereas others would be significant. So therefore, what we would have is a possible uneven level of development, because the issue about ring fencing is, if you were to ring fence it, um, councillors would, would stick within that box. Councillors, by the way, don't like ring fencing, they're against it full stop, but, they, but um, how, how, would, how would we work that? How, would we, how do we restore a kind of balance across Scotland, given the, what I've said in terms of cultural funding? Because it seems to be, there's a hugely varying picture across the country. Joe, um so you interestingly said restore balance. I'm not sure there's ever been balance. I, I, so I think we need to really think about what is it we want? What is it we want right. mm -hmm. for the whole of the country? And also thinking about it entirely through local authority boundaries is quite tricky because not everybody entirely lives within local authority. But every this is a fascinating table that we've all, we've all seen. There's specific stories that underpin each one. So the reason Glasgow is so high and Edinburgh so low is because of national funding directly into national institutions. You know, and that, that just in lo looking at the dynamics between Glasgow and Edinburgh, there's, there's a whole session just on that, potentially, um, because Glasgow then has a responsibility for it. In effect, you know, organisations like Kelvin Grove that are operating nationally but not funded as, as, as such. So there's not just the Creative Scotland funding, there's not just the local authority funding, there's also the, na the directly funded national organisations, the performance companies and, and those that hold collections. Um, so it's really, really complex. Um, and I don't know what, how you, how you do, how, I don't know how you get to the balanced position because if we're talking in terms of a budget that is finite, um, I don't think you want to slice it more and more because then you start getting into a position where you're funding such small amounts to fail. You're not funding anybody enough to really thrive and to really develop and evolve in the way that we want, nor do I think anybody wants to rewind 70 years of investment that's gone in to certain places because you've got infrastructure set up, you've got phenomenal expertise in certain places. It's actually, you know, so that's the context in which we're working. How do we then try and be more equitable across the geography of Scotland, bearing in mind that it's so complex and dynamic within that. So even in a city like Edinburgh, you'll have a conversation around festival and city centre focus. But, you know, <laughs> urban neighbourhoods on the periphery of the city centre feeling they don't get their fair share. You'll have the same in all the major cities, I'm sure. Dundee's the same, and Renfrewshire, we've got it between Paisley and the other towns and villages. So there's layers and layers and layers of how you balance, balance it. It's not as simple as just the national and the to the local authority area. Do you know what I mean? Yes. We have a baseline. How do we have a minimum cultural provision, if you like? If we're yeah, actually and at the moment it's described to, as adequate provision. So libraries for... are described as how do you provide adequately a library service for an area? And it is, you know, there's so much you can, you can interpret around that. I kind of wonder if it is about adequate provision or whether it is about these conversations that have come through the current draft culture strategy and certainly were kind of quite a powerful part of the 2005 Cultural Commission, which were around the concept of, of rights and entitlement. What do you, what as a citizen, a resident of this country, mm -hmm. do you expect to have culturally? And looking at like things like the UN Sustainable Development Goals, that kind of Indeed. thing as well. I know Mr Murdoch, I think, wants to come in, but I want specifically, Mr Murdoch, you talked about the you know, People Equity Fund, the 120 million relative to the 90 odd million that, that uh, you know, um, Creative Scotland get. But um, obviously some of that PEF money, although there might be an encouragement from government to spend it on STEM subjects, which there clearly is, but you know, you're obviously the director of Leisure and Cultures and Do you lobby, for example, head teachers to invest in drama teachers or music teachers or musical instruments or other creative arts? I mean, how, how does it, does that happen in terms of ensuring some of that PEF money in deprived areas goes into cultural pursuits? Yeah, of course it does. So um, there is there is a lobbying for that. Um, I, I meet with all my colleagues who are head teachers of primary and secondary schools. I think that the message they get, however, is directed much more to what you would see as conventional educational attainment rather than proving the, the whole confidence-based, quality of life, um, self-esteem that participation in arts, music, drama, culture can create for young people. So 
uh, to date, it may change, but to date, uh, the level of investment that's come through Attainment Challenge or PEF and it's been reinvested into the cultural sector is uh, very, very small out, out of that percentage. Now, is that in Dundee or is that across Scotland? I can only speak for Dundee. So, uh, yeah. Dundee. And I don't think it's something which is in any sense, um, there's, there's no sense of a negativity towards what arts and culture can do. Mm -hmm. It's more the reverse. It's more the priority that is perceived by uh, the teaching professions, by the head teachers, by those who are judging them about where they should invest that money and okay. where, they, where they will get returns. Okay. Now, that may change over time, but it was, for me, it was an interesting example of when government makes a strategic investment in one area, which has the potential, as Leone said, to be cross-cutting or transversal, mm -hmm. unless it comes with guidance or support or a mechanism to make sure that happens, it won't flow into um, mm -hmm. other creative practices. It'll be kind of replicating what we know because that's what we teach and that's what we've been judged against. OK, that's interesting. And now, Mr Cameron, in Creative Scotland's submission, you talk about um, what artists, individual artists, actually earn. You say that um, within Scotland, 80% of artists earn less than £10,000 a year through their artistic output. Two-thirds earn less than 5000 and only 2% generate earnings over £20,000, while um, in 2017, median earnings was £28,354. So how many art people define themselves as artists? artists in Scotland, do you know? I mean, obviously you must have an idea, otherwise you wouldn't be able to generate these figures. And how are people defined as artists? Because, um, you know, how, 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 if someone is only earning, you know, like a few bob a year as an artist, but they're actually working as a, you know, as a teacher or, I don't know, a bus driver or whatever it happens to be, um, how, how, can, how is someone um, defined as an artist in Scotland? I mean, how do we, how do we get a grip of that? I, that's a very complex question. Um, I think um, Professor Richard DeMarco, um, before he before it, talked about ev you know everyone is an artist, and if someone is like him, wouldn't wish to define what an artist is. But I, I take the I take the question is clearly those figures are stark. They've been discussed at length. I think it's a question for Creative Scotland, but it's a question for us as a country, actually, in terms of how the opportunities are afforded to artists opportunities that allow them to, to, to deliver their creative practice, to work with communities, to engage. That's a big question for us as a country. I think Leone pointed towards some examples in other countries, including Germany and I believe Ireland, have got an official status attached to specific qualifications. Um, you perhaps know more of the detail around that, but I think it's a more progressive way of thinking about how an artist can position themselves as a profession, in, in inadvertent commas. On a broader point, I think we, we are all creative. We, we, we are artists in our own way, but there is a way for us to think about how we could um, get a clearer status for, for the role of an artist. OK. And, um, now, Creative Scotland commissioned a report which said that uh, in terms of EU funding, uh, a minimum of £23 million was invested in Scotland's creative sectors uh, over the decade to 2016. Um, and it said that the proposed UK Shared Prosperity Fund will be needed to support development. Uh, this will be particularly felt by rural areas of Scotland where EU funding has been critical. Now, obviously, nothing is actually happening on that. It was supposed to be consulted on the end of last year, and it's effectively in paralysis, uh, like the whole Brexit issue, I would say. So I'm just wondering, um, what, what is the gearing effect to that £23 million? What does it actually lever in in terms of additional funding? And are there any contingencies in place in Creative Scotland, or are you working with Scottish uh, Government to try and create contingencies should that uh, source of funding um, effectively be cut off without a replacement? We've, we have responded to the particular um, call for um, opinion on that, and we've made the case for the, uh, any future funds that come should um, prioritise culture as a minimum to the same level. Um, in, in relation to leader funding in particular, is correct that I mean uh, David made the point earlier that it was included in the match funding for the place partnership, and that is in the case in other place partnerships we have. So it's very it's, it's a very important um, source of support. But looking beyond the funding, it's about connecting us to the world. It's about building those partnerships, those relationships. It's about really important opportunities from artists in Scotland to uh, export their talent and to build relationships, and equally to bring artists into Scotland to help create the sort of vibrant cultural life that we want, one that's, that's truly international. So beyond the funding, it's about, it's about relationships. It's about how Scotland connects with the rest of the world. In terms of that, those relationships and those connections, I mean, I mean you, obviously, 
as I've already said, you said it's particularly felt by rural areas of Scotland where EU funding has been critical. What kind of um, artistic projects, you know, would be threatened without that kind of funding, and what kind of areas would be impacted? It's um, so leader funding in particular, which is the one that has had a specific emphasis, has supported whether it's capital developments for specific cultural projects or whether it's been support for place partnerships and initiatives. There is a requirement for that to be um, to be. There will be a gap there. I think that that is evident. Um, so those projects and those initiatives will have to be supported in a different in a different way. Um, the word threat. Um, I think we just have to think differently about how we could support those. But our, our key point is that the resource that cur currently comes in through those should be replaced, whether that's through new mechanisms that come in or thinking about differently about existing resources. But it's important. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. Thanks very much. Uh, Annabel. Uh, thank you. Convener, good morning. Uh, we've been having a very interesting uh, discussion. Um, picking up on, on a, a point that was made earlier uh, about regional presence, uh, a regional presence for Creative Scotland and really getting into that kind of area. A, a point that has been made to us when we've been out and about, so for example recently the Dunfermline uh, Fire Station Creative venue, which is a fantastic venue, we had a, an outreach workshop and the point was consistently made that people felt, the perception anyway was that um, the, the focus of Creative Scotland was on the central belt mm -hmm. uh, and in that regard I understand that there's a uh, research has been prioritised into looking at um, culture in Scotland's cities. So th th that just adds to this perception. And, you know, as the MSP for Cowden Beath, I mean, I, I'm here to represent my constituents and I, I need to be assured that the mindset, I think that's the key thing, that everything comes from what the mindset of the organisation is and the people who are involved in wider uh, culture in Scotland in terms of uh, facilitating, promoting, uh, allocating spending to, um, th what, what do we do to ensure that everybody gets a shot in Scotland? Or do you not share the, the concerns that have been expressed to us? Um, I, I can answer that. From a, um, so I myself come from a rural community. My role, um, if you were to see my um, carbon footprint, I wouldn't be too proud of it. But. We, we, you know, we are physically present as much as possible. Um, we attend funding events um, so that we can talk to as many people as possible in one sitting. We, we, where possible, we attend sort of different network meetings. So, as much as we are, are possible, we are physically present. And, and my team and other teams um, do get there. I think it's a it's a wider question um, around. Um, so Stuart touched on sort of regional presence. But again, for me, it's about it's about how we work. I think the resource is an issue, a challenge for Creative Scotland. Um, it's difficult for us to be physically present in, in all 32 local author authority areas. Even more difficult when you when you zoom in on those local authority areas and you, you go to different towns and different places and they, they, they each would have a case for, for wishing Creative Scotland. But it's about how we work. So back to my earlier point about keeping with our partnerships, but developing those a little bit further, alongside thinking about how we can make sure that we're that we're accessible um, and physically present as much as possible. I'm oh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to. I, I, I mean, I do accept that you know you don't want to be spending a lot of money just uh, taking a box by having a wee office or something. That's not really the point I was trying to make. Rather, the point I was trying to make was that uh, leads to a, 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 a perception uh, in terms of spend and spend on uh, cultural activities that actually Creative Scotland is really focused on central belt and cities and that's it and that's where all the money goes and you know an example uh, yet again to feed that narrative is that the research that's currently being prioritized is looking at what can be done uh, more in cities where the majority of the investment is already in any event so it's really how do how do we then as a committee uh, assure people who have raised that concern with us that that is not the case? How do we give them that assurance that they're seeking? Can I cover you? Yeah, no, no. Just because I've got experience working in Creative Scotland and now in a in a place that's not, sent, not I mean, we're close to Central Park, but we're, uh, we're not Glasgow or, or Edinburgh. And actually, I think the responsibility sits in all of us a wee, a wee bit. Um, and 
there's something about net networks that's really, really important. And I was thinking about it when I was listening to the place partnership conversation, that actually what we've developed through the place partnerships is almost like a network, but it's got no formality around it. So there's people who have experience of it that actually, so there's epicenters developing of really good practice um, that aren't cities, that are towns and villages, and some of them are cities that maybe we could actually learn from in that. So there is some really active networks that are brilliant, like the Creative Learning Network that operates around Scotland underneath the Creative Learning Plan, supported by Creative Scotland and Education Scotland and others. There used to be something called Cultural Connectors and that network. They were really, really important and they almost did the work of all of us. They represented national and local interests and they created a forum that wasn't reliant on one set of officers and one organisation. And I wonder if we need to be thinking a little bit about that as well, as well as maybe looking at new partnership models and shared posts and secondments and all those things. I've been the beneficiary of being able to work in lots of different organisational, national and local contexts and one being a secondment. And they're really, really valuable because actually you only learn from genuinely experiencing the different perspectives you get by either working nationally or locally. So I think there's, there's other things we can do as well as thinking about how the regional outlook of Creative Scotland is enhanced, because I think everybody would totally agree with you. Your question, the Creative Scotland wants to be national. There is sometimes when you're in that organisation, to be really honest, um, because of the, the dominance of the funding programmes and the work that you do, which is right, because they're the most important thing the organisation does, that you see the world through those funding programmes. And your word outlook, as I think, is one of, that's so important to all of this. How do you step back from that and just make sure your outlook is broad enough and that you're able to see what's not in the funding programmes as well as what, what is in them? But I think we all need to kind of help with that by working with Creative Scotland to try and get that kind of bigger view within Creative Scotland. But also when you're working locally, there's an attitude sometimes that's a, that pervades local working, which is you just work locally, and that you don't inve invest in your colleagues and your staff teams to also pursue national networks and conversations. And I think mm. local authorities have to have a wee think about, about that, I would, I would suggest, because you want to be thinking, working locally, thinking nationally and internationally, working nationally, thinking locally and internationally. We all, we all want that, but we all need to do that. I would, I would agree about networks and some, I think there's an opportunity for Creative Scotland to make more use of the networks that currently exist and we're a network of 440 plus artists and arts organisations, Dumfries and Galloway. There are other networks in the Stove have a, a, a really big network and DG Arts Festival have a network, a promoters network and, and actually we convene a group called a partners group of representatives from all these bodies. So there's actually a lot of intelligence and resource that um, having a closer relationship with Creative Scotland we'd be able to help each other really sort of like uh, um, there is the, this perception of funding I mean there is a, there's a perception when the regular funding decisions were made you know there was chat locally sort of like you know uh, we you know we've only got sort of x percent of the of the budget but actually you know the flip side is that we had 100% success rate. We had two organisations apply. They were both successful. But there is another... Co um, we did a piece of work in around that, con uh, around that conversation to try and figure out, actually, you know, what's, what's behind that. And, and it, the, the folk that have uh, the established... Uh, people who have established relationships with Croke Scotland felt really well supported and they felt that they... They listened and, and where they could, they would connect. Um, but there was a perception that those, predominantly coming from practitioners, actually felt like if you didn't have a, an established relationship with Creative Scotland, it was difficult to find a way in, and that, uh, perhaps because of an organisational structure you know, and, and capacity. So I think it's a really complex area, but I think actually we have a richness across the country where maybe working in a different way, we could help each other. Can I make two brief comments? I mean, I, I, I'm not close to that, but in a... I'm not sure if Dundee is in the central belt, is it? But if Dundee wasn't a central belt, it as is a it city. Is. So mm -hmm. as, as a city, yep. our commitment is to, to working very closely with Angus, much more rural authority, North Fife, much more rural authority, and with Perth and Ross. And there's been... In fact, Gary came and spoke at it. There's been a, a regional collaboration of local authorities to look at the way that the cultural sector can work together to try and make sure that what they do is both integrated, that there's a pathway for skills development, that programmes are as far as possible coordinated to avoid um, audience division. 
and, and within that, that kind of collaboration has happened within the sector without any kind of instruction. It's happened because the sector wants to collaborate and can see the benefit for cultural tourism, for staff development, etc. The RFO organisations are based in the cities, but they have within that the commitment to outreach, and they take their product and they are very open. And if you look at the travel to work area, for, for a city like Dundee, it's quite large. It's about 70, 80 miles that people will commute into Dundee and audiences will commute in if the programme is good. So I think that relationship is, if you divided it right down per capita to every local authority, you would never sustain quality. So it's, it's, a, it's about that relationship between um, rural, urban. So, but I, I'm, I'm not taking any away from the, the perception. The perception will always exist, I guess, that the cities or that the, the central belt are getting a bigger slice of the cake. Well, thank you very much for your comments. And uh, I mean, it's an issue that obviously we should all reflect on, as Suni said, we've all got responsibility. I mean, I do take the point. So, for example, at that workshop in Dunfermline, uh, many of the organisations represented both public, uh, Fife College, private sector bodies, did recognise that they need to perhaps be working together better, pan Fife, you know, the brand, and get organised themselves. So that is something. I think each area would have to take responsibility for. But I, I, I do take the point about uh, you know, quality and if you subdivide and subdivide, and the point Leone made earlier about the need for something to thrive as opposed to just getting a bit of money with a, a box ticked and not being able to thrive going forward. But I still think that work can be done, and I do think it's a mindset. I do think it's a mindset, and I think we all need to have a slightly different mindset. One other area of question, if I may, it's... Um, uh, looking then at cities and just wonder and uh, surrounding areas, what impact you're seeing uh, thus far in terms of uh, city region deals. Um, last week we had Federation of Scottish Theatre here and actually uh, they were able to say that Pitlochry Festival Theatre had sub secured substantial funding under the city region deals. So this is obviously a potential bit of good news um, just uh, to hear what's happening in, in other parts of Scotland. Yeah, we've both got them for our areas, and I well, sure it can speak obviously much better, but the tasting one of which culture is a, a part. So we're obviously part of the, the, the Glasgow um, region city deal, but culture doesn't feature in the way that it does in the in the Tayside one, which is more similar. And so it's like the, Ed, the wider Edinburgh one as well, where culture doesn't really feature. And my understanding is that largely it's the release of capital money, which Pitt Lockery has benefited from. Um, where it features for us is around tourism, because tourism is a, a kind of collective ambition of the city deal for the wider area and actually there is now more coming together, there is groups, there's both operational strategic thinking about culture's role within tourism, which for um, Glasgow and for Paisley and Renfrewshire, cultural tourism is a massive growth area, so it's one of our main areas of focus for, is Paisley. So yeah, I think it's not just about what money it unlocks again, which and it can be significant capital, you're absolutely right. Um, and we'll see what happens with the next, if there is going to be a next iteration of these of these deals and maybe we do all need to make a kind of greater play for where culture features within it. Um, so yeah, they are another opportunity, absolutely. And it's about money, but ways of working. But again, it's actually about the perception of culture within what are actually kind of economic interventions. Um, and it's about actually trying to really kind of step up to that economic mark as well from a cultural perspective and say, we need to be part of this for all of these reasons and being ready to do that. And I think the Tayside City Deal is really doing, really doing that. Because you could perhaps answer this as well, Stuart. So you mentioned, Lily, that uh, for some uh, city region deals, culture is not kind of directly a part thereof, but for the Tay uh, deal it is. Why, why is that? Why is it not part of everybody's...? Uh... Well, I can't speak for any others. I know that in Tayside, or in Dun the, the Tay cities, not Tayside, Tay uh, the Tay cities one, it is very much there as cultural tourism. So it has to have that economic impact. It's not cultural development. It's not artist development. Yes. It's linked absolutely to building on the back of the investment that Perth and Ross uh, and Dundee in particular have put into culture-led regeneration and to try and make sure that that is fully exploited and developed. The challenges, as I'm sure you heard from, from others, is the timescale for implementation and for the flow through and the money. So the announcement of the 350 million um, was celebrated and people are really excited about it. What wasn't profiled was it's a 15-year programme. <laughs> So there's an expectation of the 350 million being there now and managing that and actually working out how much of that will flow out and, and when, I think, is a huge challenge for those who are closer to that programme than I am. But it is fantastic to have it, make no mistake. And it has energised, again, both artists, 
the governance bodies of, of arts organisations and the collaboration between the different local authorities and the Tay City deal. There's, so just, there's opportunity within it as well, even if though it's not maybe sort of directly set out about being cultural development. So for our area, you know, there's a new bridge that's going to connect communities across the Clyde for the first time and give access to public transport to a community that they've not had before. And, you know, there's, so there's really exciting cultural opportunities within it as well. So I think it's about thinking about the direct and indirect opportunities of, of initiatives like the, the City Deal, of which there is a bounty, to be, to be honest. So it's, Oh, well, that's some good news then. Yeah. <laughs> Can I maybe come back on your city research as well? Because I don't sure, think either yeah. of us answered you in that. And I'm thinking you're referring to something called the the, U the Core Cities Cultural Inquiry that was UK-wide. Yeah. Is that the research that you're meaning? And um, I think Creative Scotland were a research... Well, I know they were a research partner in that, and I was a wee bit involved in it when I was in, was in government. And I don't think it... And it, it's unfortunate if it's created a perception that that's Creative Scotland's sole interest, because my understanding being in government and then local government and being interested in it was that actually it was a UK-wide thing, so there was an interesting sort of learning opportunity there from what cities like, you know, Manchester and Birmingham are doing around things that we were talking around in terms of tax levies, but also it presented quite an interesting idea called cultural compacts, which I think is kind of what we're talking about here, which is where leadership sets, where ownership sets, and how you create a framework where you bring national multi-agencies and communities together, and that's what, that was in that. We then, uh, under Creative Scotland's facilitation, had a, a kind of session around it held in in Perth, and we were there not as a city. We were there totally championing for the towns and the villages, and actually there was a colleague from Perth there who said, what we're talking about here isn't necessarily just cities. In Scotland, we're slightly different from England, maybe. What we're talking about is epicentres of where culture's being used as a catalyst for change to support things like community empowerment, you know, and all the other kind of really good things that are kind of around in kind of public policy discourse at the moment. So although its name was maybe cities, I think it has the potential to have greater influence in some of the kind of areas that we've been ta you've been talking about at this committee. Okay, that's helpful. And again, it's back to perception and yeah. language. And and you should, we should always be working to change perception if it's negative like that, I think. Yeah. So but thanks for that. Great. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Did you want to? Uh, just, just a brief supplementary. Um, Stuart Murdoch talked about the situation in Dundee, and there used to be a debate around Dundee's tax base being quite low, um, but people from North East Fife and other areas around about, they come into the city, get all the advantages of it, but don't contribute to the tax base. So when you put, is that so an act? I don't know if other cities and areas have similar. So you look at somewhere like Clackmannan, which has had huge cuts to its um, culture budget, but is a tiny council and has big financial challenges. Just because Clackmannan is cutting back on its cultural offer, which is a really concerning development, people in Clackmannan will go elsewhere. It is a small. Um, area. So it's that idea of people moving about the area, but the local authority having the responsibility in providing it for everybody. It's not just people in Dundee or in Paisley you're providing culture to, people will come in. Is that, has that been kind of overtaken by city deals and other kind of partnership models? I, I'm not sure. I, I think if you look at the way in which the boundaries of local government work and the services and the citizens that use the services of local government, the two are out of alignment. So uh, a facility like the Olympia Leisure Centre, probably about 30, 40 per cent of the users of that will come from the periphery of Dundee, maybe, maybe even higher. So we're providing services in a city that service a city region. That is the nature of the beast. Mm -hmm. The boundaries are very tightly drawn. I think the question below that is no one's going to have an appetite for going back into the boundaries. Should we not be looking more equitably at the funding? And to some extent, Creative Scotland's RFO funding does that. So by funding theatre in Dundee, which is attracting people from a fairly large catchment area, the beneficiaries of that are those who live in North East Fife, Angus, and further afield. Um, but I think there are that, the, the abiding challenge for a local authority is it's got to work within the costs of the services it provides, and the funding it gets doesn't always reflect that. So I think there's a real challenge of how you actually sustain regional services in a very small city like Dundee that for the tax is, 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 is perhaps having to be funded from a very small and impoverished, in fact, tax mm -hmm. base. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, Stuart. Uh, thank you. Just a couple of quick questions. First of all, um, earlier on, uh, Gary, you said that, uh, that how we work collaboratively and we need to learn uh, to do more uh, regarding Creative Scotland. And uh, Leone, you uh, you highlighted that uh, that we all need to work. Uh, kind of all of us being kind of the politicians as well, we all need to work more to to engage. Uh, that was with uh, Creative Scotland, um, and that kind of struck me that um, since well, therefore since 2010, 
uh, it clearly indicates that uh, the case of Scotland actually hasn't been as engaging uh, with all of Scotland and potentially has really just focused uh, most of its attention on the, on the larger cities uh, as compared to all of the country. And so I'm just keen to get your thoughts. Yeah, do you want to go for us? Um, so I, think I can speak in the context of the Place Partnership, which yeah. is about, it's about building capacity um, and it's a way of working in an area that allows us not to be passive and say, for example, we, we didn't receive applications from X areas. It's a way of working. It's a way of us, um, I guess, and, and we've had the Inverclyde Place Partnership, mm. which you'll be familiar with, where from that we've worked very closely with the Council to develop the Beacon through Rig Arts and the Galoshans Festival. We've worked in 16 parts of Scotland to try and build that capacity, and we've been very proactive um, in trying to do that. When we talk about doing more, it is about the phase two that's being referred to. Our creative learning networks exist all across Scotland. Um, we're currently having those conversations across different parts of Scotland, thinking about how we can, we can work uh, across Scotland more uh, effectively. We've also commissioned research which seeks to, I guess, look un beneath the figures you have presented in front of you in, in relation to local authorities and to ask the question of all the local authorities looking forward, how can we work with you? What's your expectations of Creative Scotland? And how can we work collaboratively? So we're proactively going out there and asking that. That will be difficult. We don't have the resource base to answer, I'm sure, what each of the 32 local authorities would ideally like us to, to do. But we are being proactive and we are continuing to consider how we can work more collaboratively. Yeah, I mean, I'll maybe try and reflect on my, my time in Creative Scotland. And I, I'm kind of struck by your, your question. Does it mean that Creative Scotland haven't been engaging with anybody other than the major cities since 2010? And I, I honestly don't think it... It is true. I think if there's perceptions around that, then we need to really think hard about those. And I'm sure Creative Scotland are doing that at the moment because I know they're doing an awful lot of, um, you know, deep thinking about what who what their organisation is and who, what role it plays in, in kind of the public sector in Scotland and its its values and its priorities. I kind of wonder actually if the reality of it is more that because of existing infrastructure, which is the result of over 70 years of arts funding. Um, means that the majority of the infrastructure is within certain places at the moment. So, you, so there's, there is a, a need to have a debate about how do you keep that existing infrastructure going? How do you build on the expertise that it's created? I mean, the Edinburgh Festivals are part of that. You want to keep that going, because look what it does for us in terms of our, our world relations and our position. And yeah, there's more that they can all be doing locally, and I think that's now very much part of their, their thinking strategically across all of those festivals. But you've also got a city like Glasgow, which is you know a powerhouse for production and development across the arts and, and and screen and the creative industries as well. So you keep all that going. So I wonder if it's more that Creative Scotland, and also, that it, you know, we all know that it's had some ma massive challenges in, the, in, in its formation and how it's kind of got to grips with the breadth of its responsibility across the arts, screen, creative industries. I think we're seeing now much more kind of traction around screen. It's got an identity and it's kind of really going for it. So maybe now when things settle about it, it's time to sort of think again about, so what's the, what's the, the role of the arts within Creative Scotland and what it does for the art sector? Because screen's gone, certainly kind of been making some really impressive developments I think, and and if it's about the funding programmes of be responding to existing infrastructure, how do you then go forward from that? And I think that's probably where I think questions around other sort of towns and villages and how do they get a chance to develop their own infrastructure? And I think back to the to the point around um, whether it's okay for a local authority like Clackmannanshire to be reducing budget in the way that it is because it can it can access culture in other places. You, what you want is for people in Scotland to be able to access the bigger epicentres like Edinburgh and Glasgow and also to have access on their doorstep. You want, a, you want a local library, you want culture to be riven through the curriculum so that every kid going into a nursery or a classroom or a secondary school is having a cultural experience. They're, they are also cultural buildings, our nurseries, our schools, primary and secondary, so we need to be kind of thinking like that around it as well. Um, but I think honestly, I work, you know, there's people in Creative Scotland who work really, really hard, who are specialist experts. And I think sometimes they're trying very, very hard to do everything that I think you're wanting to do, but, but there's, there's, there's reasons that they're, they're challenged in, in that, and largely it's around demand of funding programmes. Um, and I think that then creates the perception that, you, that you're talking about. So um, I think that's probably where we need to kind of keep coming back to, is how do we all collectively get Creative Scotland and to a place where it, when it, where it can have more space to do all the things that we want it to do. Um, at the moment, it does an awful lot of, of saying no to people, and nobody wants to be doing that. Nobody wants to do that 
that is a job um, when you're kind of distributing funding. Everybody working in there wants to do it because they want culture to be thriving across all of Scotland. Um, but I think they've been responding to existing infrastructure, probably. Just as an additional point, it's, which is related to funding but slightly different, is the, the landscape in terms of how we can collaborate locally is changing. So we've touched on local authority budgets being under pressure, but what that means on the ground is often that, that the staff, the, the arts development officers or cultural coordinators that historically have been in place across all of Scotland, either the post is no longer in place or has changed radically. Now, these are really important on the ground. I've been one of those. So you're, you're the conduit between artists community representatives and you're a connector and you help things to happen and you also you're the person that can link them through to Creative Scotland. Those posts are, are patchwork, they're not uniform across Scotland. So our ability to have that on the ground expertise and ability for us to actually work with communities and with artists locally, where there isn't an arts development officer or in the case or DG Unlimited who are fulfilling aspects uh, really, really well it's difficult and, or it's more challenging than what say, it was, say, 10 years ago. Yeah. I think that's very helpful, the two of you replies. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, the place partnerships, how do you analyse the outcomes? You know, from, because obviously it's very easy to say, well, we're putting in a quarter of a million in errors with the match funding, <coughs> but actual outcomes, how, how are they analysed? So, um, in particular cases, we've had them independently evaluated. Um, so Education Scotland have undertaken um, independent evaluation on that. We have a reporting structure because, um, where, which requires um, local partners to roll back. Because of the flexibility of the fund there, and the differences in the activity and the differences in type of things across region, there isn't a uniform prescribed set of outcomes. Mm -hmm. But what we ask each group is to reflect on and evidence the impact that they've had. So in some cases, that may be feedback from artists. In other cases, it may be um, you know, quantitative information. <laughs> Um, but it's a development fund. There isn't a hard and fast, we think you should achieve X, Y and Z by year one. But we are conscious of enduring that there is a positive set of outcomes. But they vary across the partnerships. Okay. Uh, and notwithstanding the, the research that should be taking place on the ground anyway within local authorities, uh, when the analysis uh, is uh, published, does uh, Creative Scotland send that around to all the other place partnerships so that others can potentially learn from each other? Absolutely. Um, that will be published and circulated. Uh, it will be published on our website and circulated around all place partnerships, but also around all 32 local authorities. It's our intention to hold a meeting to bring together all those that are interested to learn it. But during the year, we also hold two or three sessions out with, and we've had one in Dumfries and Galloway, where we bring representatives from across Scotland and from across the place partnerships together to learn. Just recently, we had a, a, a cohort from the Murray Place Partnership visit Dumfries and Galloway. So we're trying to facilitate that exchange of knowledge across Scotland. Um, and we're doing that as much as we can. But it is challenging that the budgets, even for travel, are under mm -hmm. huge scrutiny now. So, but we, we are actively trying to, to sh promote learning. OK, that's helpful. Um, and uh, on the, the question regarding the city deals, um, I mean, it's a hugely important opportunity uh, for all of Scotland or the different projects that are there. Um, and obviously Annabelle asked uh, some questions about it earlier. Um, obviously my focus will be regarding the, the Glasgow city region deal, uh, and particularly obviously Inverclyde. Um, how, do you, how, how do you see the, uh, the genuine uh, arts and cultural benefit uh, from the spend that's actually that's, that's going to take place, and it's certainly for Glasgow, it's about 1.13 billion pounds. So it's not a, not small money. And so how, how do you genuinely see um, how more people more people on the ground can actually be engaged and get involved uh, to have a, a better um, economic and social uh, return, certainly for the uh, the Inverclyde community? Well, is that in well, I can, um, we'll go to yourself first, Karen. Well, I think in, in, in broad terms, um, the city region deal, or uh, in fact any um, significant investment in culture, um, can bring economic return. I think it, for me, it's about making sure that that is that's particularly relevant to that region. So it's not about um, replicating a model from Edinburgh um, or Glasgow. It's about thinking about the particular needs um, of that community. But I think for me, in the context of the city region deals, and the same principle applies, it's about leadership. So how, and cultural leadership, so how is culture and the arts 
considered? How is it even considered within the economic development of that region? And it's about developing an understanding of, although it might not be the primary driver or the immediate thing, that culture can have a positive economic and social and cultural impact, all those three things. Yeah, I mean, sim similar, but I suppose there's something maybe specific around the, the Greater Glasgow and for, for our areas of interest in it, which obviously there's a lot of investment going into to manufacturing and innovation in manufacturing. And, you know, we kind of stand on the shoulders of innovators that are hundreds of years old in Paisley and wider Renfrewshire and kind of manufacturing. And within that will also be creativity, obviously. So I think it is about, it's a little bit about perception too for us, because it, maybe talking about Paisley specifically, one of the, the kind of step changes that I worked to is to radically change the image and reputation of Paisley, which for too long has been one that's been beset by narratives of poverty and post-industrial decline. And one of the key ways that we're, trying to challenge that is to by no means uh, not address the systemic poverty and the inequality that comes from that within some of the communities within Renfrewshire, but actually to also use culture and creativity within those communities and the kind of potential within those communities and within our town centre and our you know really glorious civic buildings to tell different stories and tell different stories to be told. So there's perception within it, then there's jobs. There's just being able, being able that will create jobs within Renfrewshire and I'm sure in Inverclyde as well. And I do think there's also symbolic interventions occurring within it, like the bridge over the Clyde again, it will be bringing communities together, there'll be cultural repercussions of that, so you're just thinking about how you, you bring communities together around all of that is really important, and then obviously another thing that I worked in my step changes is um, considering the development of creativity as a new dimension to the economy and actually the city deal is, creates fertile territory for us to do that and to be really at the cutting edge of innovation and you, there's a relationship of that to the funded cultural sector um, it's how you, are, you understand creativity and the arts at school through to what you, people are studying, that also fits into kind of creativity and economic development. There's a relationship between all of that. Public funding of the culture sector, you know, over time enables us to have the sorts of communities and the sort of countries with people with innovative skills that can then actually be at the cutting edge of the things that the city deal in our area are trying, are trying to do. So it, there, there is a relationship across all of it if we get it, it all right. So yeah, lots and lots of opportunity and tourism and events. Um, a really, really big part of it. So all the tourists that are going into Glasgow and looking at the sites there, simple opportunity for us to then uh, collectively all be sharing each other's treasures, I suppose, as well as, you know, the kind of communication around it's important too. Okay. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you very much. Ross Greer. Thank you, Kamira. I'm interested in the thread that came out of Annabel Ewing's questions around the economic impact in relation to the, the city deals. Obviously, the economic impact shouldn't, uh, of, of culture in Scotland more generally shouldn't be underestimated. But at the same time, in the evidence that we've heard so far, as you would expect, many artists would advocate that um, art for art's sake is a perfectly uh, valid use uh, of, of public money. Um, and, and they would be right. But in more mundane processes than the, the city deals, you know, in, in council's annual budget setting processes, do you find yourselves having to to justify the cultural uh, spend based on economic impact more than you would otherwise like to? Is, is there a wider understanding, particularly at senior management level, elected representative level within councils, uh, that looking beyond the economic impact is, is an appropriate way to make budget decisions on culture spend? Well, I take that from a, a, lo a local authority perspective. <laughs> Um, economic impact is certainly there, and, and uh, to try and uh, defend, which is what it is, the budget that's invested in culture, we've got Ecogen to look at the economic impact of the cultural strategy. They took the financial year, I think it was 2018, 2017-18, and did a, a very interesting study by the economic impact in Dundee. Again, that could be made available if it was of interest to the committee. Um, so it's independent research into what is the economic impact of a city council, Creative Scotland and charitable investment in the delivery of a cultural strategy in one city. It surprised us. It surprised us how impactful it was. And the, the one thing that they, they, they produced which we hadn't seen, hadn't anticipated, was the welfare benefits. I'm not sure if that's come up in any of the committee's research, but they looked at the, the whole of life benefits, the benefit to the health service uh, and the benefit to older people in terms of their engagement in the arts. So they put an economic measure, which I hadn't seen before, against that. That's all helped to make the case for the investment, but it doesn't protect it against the kind of current financial pressures that local authorities are under. So it may have... It may, I don't think there's any sense that it's not um, understood, not, not valued, 
I think you, you fall back to uh, when, you, when you're sitting trying to balance a local authority's budget, where are you going to draw the line? Um, I think uh, we can't avoid it. We have to measure economic impact of, of everything across our society. And, you know, so, and that's, um, we certainly do that in terms of our conversations with Dumfries and Galloway Council. We measure, you know, additional leverage monies coming in from funding. Um, interesting, I just want to make the point, interesting enough, in uh, Dumfries, uh, there's, a hotel, there's, a ho there's a hotel here? There's someone building a hotel on the Crichton campus, uh, campus, and they're doing that specifically because of the cultural offer of Dumfries and Galloway as a region. And um, so we're a few years away from this, but as part of this um, uh, the change in the campus there, there's, there's, there's uh, potential going to be a new music venue as well, and it's something that we don't have in our region. But it just shows that actually from a, a business perspective, an economic perspective, someone's identified the opportunities that culture creates. Uh, certainly the local authority uh, in Dumfries and Galloway invests uh, heavily, significantly in its major events and festivals. Um, and um, they, as part of their reporting, require the festivals report back on the economic impact of the money that they've invested. And certainly they've increased that target for, for this year. Um, can't remember the numbers, you'll have to forgive me, but I could get them for the committee if you needed them. Um, but it is, it is part of the picture, but for, um, just to go back to what I said earlier, it's actually the, there is a potential to measure the impact of culture on our society in other ways, potentially other than empirical data. And, yeah, sorry, Ron. Um, I think probably it is the reality for a lot of Lot of people and local authorities that they are having to justify it in the terms that you set out. So jumping back, if it's all right to do so, to the to the um, pending culture strategy, I think it's another opportunity that that strategy kind of gives us, which is that if but you, to get all the 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 benefits and the outcomes that culture can bring across all the other areas that we're talking about, whether it be economic or inequality, health inequalities or or you know education, all those sorts of things, you've got to use public funding as a mixed funding sort of you know, economy, I suppose, around culture itself. You have to be funding and supporting it within education, artists, your organisations, because you can't, unless you've got that overall sector thriving and expert, it can't then do all those things. And if you're an artist that's also working in quite difficult contexts, that takes time and it takes money and it takes great, great care of that for that practitioner to be entering into, you know, those kind of social contexts of which many artists work or, or health ones. So I think it's about maybe trying to make the argument that it's only from the foundation of a flourishing cultural sector as a society can you reap the rewards that culture then gives across all of these other areas. And I think that's what the bid afforded us in Paisley because we got political and officer traction and partnership traction from it. So I now report to six ch step changes, which include poverty and inequality and health, which include the economy, but include well-being as well alongside that. So no one's, give her great, no one's given greater importance. And the heart of those six step changes is one about the development of cultural and creative communities themselves across Paisley and Renfrewshire. So it's at the heart of it. You get that right, and then you get the other benefits that come from it. That's maybe where we need to kind of be focusing our, our thinking nationally, and then there'll be local benefits from that. And the ALIO model is one that's, at this point now, not particularly new to local authorities and certainly not uh, exclusively to, to culture. What impact do you think the ALIO models had on cultural spend, particularly in an era of, as we've discussed previously, budgets being squeezed? Has it had any impact on expenditure itself? Or has it just been a difference in, in delivery? And the city to make very significant savings. There's no question about that. So we have a, a very, whereas when the, when the alloy was created, um, the, the areas under which were, were transferred were 62% funded by uh, local authority and the balance was come from, from generated income from sport, largely small amount from cultural events. That's completely reversed. So it's gone from 60-40 to 40-60 in terms of the, the funding model. Uh, I think you can get that over three, four, five, six years, then it plateaus. Um, the biggest challenge that the ALIO model faces at the moment is, of course, that its aspiration for development is restricted. So development plans which are based on trying to create additional income-generating streams which would 
require capital investment have now been put on hold to some extent because of the, the rates review and there's no benefit to the local authority or the ALIO. So the development of the model, I think, has been compromised, frankly, uh, because of, of the rates the rates situation that applies just now. And that doesn't apply to independent charitable arts organisations. So there's a kind of slight unevenness, a kind of weirdness in, in the funding of arts and cultural organisations that some are affected by that and some aren't. I think the definition of the ALIO is actually really problematic. We would say we are, we are a, a Scottish charity. We're regulated in the same way that other Scottish charities are. So for the board of the ALIO, they view themselves as trustees of a Scottish charity, accountable in the same way as other funded bodies are to a local authority for funding. But it has brought more opportunities than, than challenges. I think it's overall, I would say, uh, the ALIO has allowed us to develop things in the last five, six years, and I think it has more potential, actually. I think, if, not the ALIO, the SCIO. Um, uh, it's the SCIO model I'm talking about, actually. I should be clear about that, not the ALIO model. Gary, from your experience of, of dealing with a, a range of local authorities, is what Stuart's saying broadly similar across the board, or have there been different experiences? And, and how has that, that model, that change in, in governance, affected your relationship with local authorities? In terms of impact, um, it wouldn't be for me to reflect on, but I can certainly address the, the, the second point. I think um, we have very good working relationships with ALIOs um, across Scotland. Um, and they are very important and actually um, fruitful. I think for us it's also important that we maintain a relationship with the local authority, and it's also very important that the relationship between the ALIO and the local authority is strong. And I think that is the case, but I think it's mindful that that, that needs to continue. So we've discussed today about how culture can be embedded across different budgets. If it's not got a strong relationship with the local authority and a, a holistic and considered relationship with the local authority, it, there's a risk that it could sit in isolation. So I think that there are good relationships now. Um, but I think we have to be mindful of making sure that the, there's continued collaboration moving forward. And just one final question uh, around data. In terms of the uh, data that's available on national funding of uh, arts organisations uh, across the country, do you feel that there is uh, enough publicly available data, particularly for yourselves working at, at local level, for you to be aware of uh, what is being funded nationally in the areas that you're operating in? Or are there any particular gaps in that data, any greater level of depth that would be helpful to you? I think, yeah, um, there, there's a lot of data, maybe, and it's not always shared, I suppose, I think, is where your question is getting to. So I don't, I think there's organisations that are funded by Creative Scotland and others that, that spend an awful, a disproportionate amount of their time gathering data to share with whatever funder it is that we're talking about. There's a, there's a probably it leans too much towards that from the organisation's perspective, and I think they've got kind of valid points, because I think it, w it would feel like an okay thing to do for an organisation on the ground, or, you know, some of them are tiny organisations, two or three part-time staff, but having to kind of gather huge, huge amounts of information if they were aware of what benefit was coming from it and then what bigger picture it then it then got you. But it also, so, so the, yeah, there's something that I know that Creative Scotland are probably really interested in themselves is what do they do with the intelligence that they hold and how do they share it so we all benefit from it. But it's not just Creative Scotland that hold it. I think there's universities that hold it as well and it's really hard to get into onto sort of research articles that are also doing this sort of thing. So it's not just Creative Scotland. Government also holds an awful lot of data which um, maybe don't always share. Local government holds data that we also maybe don't, don't share. So there's maybe something we all need to think about in that because you also don't get the full picture when you just look at one organization's data we've got an organization in paisley that i think is one of the most significant sort of youth theater organizations in this country with phenomenal participation levels called pace theater it's never applied to creative scotland you know that's not a bad thing pace theater, you know we're about to support through town center regeneration to create a, a new a new home in, in in paisley so but it wouldn't feature in any of the data from Creative Scotland, yeah, it's a really important player in youth theatre locally and nationally. So you just need to watch what story you're telling through it as well. But I, I agree, I think there could be greater sharing and bringing together of the data that certain parties hold. But I would suggest it's much more than just Creative Scotland. Mm -hmm. Leon, can I just ask a supplementary on that, on that point? Um, our, our research from Drew Wiley suggested that observatories were a way to go in terms of gathering data together and that, that was a model that had worked well in other countries. Do you think that's a good idea or do you think it would just create another level of bureaucracy? Yeah, so we looked at this a little bit within the culture strategy actually because we had a group of academics who are expert in, I suppose, in cultural policy working 
working with us and it was, it, it, I don't know where it is at the moment, but yeah, I do think observatories are quite interesting because they bring together academia, policy and practitioners, but you need to make sure you're bringing them all together and the, the view is just not an academic one, that the view is also practitioner and organisation led and also kind of policy. And in Paisley, we've set up a research centre within the local university, University of West of Scotland, to, um, I suppose, demonstrate the change that we're making through our approach and our investment so because we understand that we need to be able to tell the story but in the way that David's setting out quantitative and qualitative and very long term I think it's about how you get that long term view and I suppose people like System are doing this with Glasgow Centre for Population Health and I do wonder if actually there would be scope for a kind of network model observatory which has a very, very long-term view that also keeps Scotland at the cutting edge of international research and cultural policy. So not just an inward-looking thing, something that's very external. I do think that would be worth looking at. And would honest. that be a way of pulling all this could be, scattered yeah. data together? Yeah, could yeah. Okay, thank you. Jamie. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I've um, got a few questions, but I want to come back to the ALO, ALO issue because I think it's quite an interesting one. I think one of the things that came out of the Barclay review was really shining a light on the Alio model. And one of the things that struck me was how wide scoping the use of them were becoming. And I think that was probably what spurred the concerns uh, by the review, in the sense that some local authorities were using them as means of setting up uh, coffee shops and dance studios and you know, Zumba classes and things like that. And I think. The, the idea that if, if you were trying to encourage people locally to take the initiative and, and compete in that level, there was no level playing field. So I guess my question is, given that all this conversation is about funding, you know, whether it's coming centrally from government or via local government, does, do you think government has other level, levers available to it, such as you know, tax regime or other forms of incentives to facilitate the growth of culture that's not specifically direct injecting cash into specific projects or organisations, what the levers are at its disposal that it could be using better? Yeah, um, yeah um, I think there is, I kind of think I made sort of reference to, so we looked at this with the culture strategy development as well, and so there are things that we were looking at and having conversations around. So a, a couple of examples, one being VAT on, um, in renovating an existing building where VAT doesn't exist on a new development. So there's lots of reasons why you would want to uh, renovate an existing building and Paisley's really kind of sort of setting itself apart by investing in its kind of heritage in a contemporary way, but you pay 20% VAT on it. So in a way, it's, it's cheaper to build a new building, yet you're not always then caring for your cultural and your heritage infrastructure and there's environmental challenges within that as well. So there are things like that that I think probably you could be looked at more. Um, once I kind of got laughed at in a meeting because somebody sort of said, but you're just trying to now fund culture through the carrier bag scheme, but I didn't really mean that in the meeting. What I meant is that there are levers that are growing and changes that are occurring. And actually I think, and it wasn't meaning that culture should be funded by the carrier bag scheme, but I was thinking a lot of good stuff out in communities is being funded by the carrier bag scheme. It's a really good um, example of how we're responding to environmental change and the reward of it is going back into communities. But, but culture is not one of the kind of prioritising sort of themes of it, you know, it might come through in communities and it's about how we get again around the table of the people making the decisions about those new opportunities. Because um, I do think there are those that exist, there are other levers out there. What it requires to do that though, from personal experience of working within the civil service and trying so hard to work across department and civil service is you need, you need a team of people to be doing that and to be working in a cross-cutting way. And you need it at officer level, political level and at senior civil service level to actually enable that to happen and to support it because it's, because legislation is, you know, they're complex areas that we're talking about here, but I think if you get the collective will and they're the, the support for it, you know, bottom up and top down, then I think there's a big opportunity there. And I've just given a couple of kind of sort of low level examples, but they make a difference. Just a brief, brief comment on, on the Alio model itself or the SCIO model that we use, the SCIO Alio. For Dundee, it has been hugely productive. Part of that is the culture shift that came by having a board of independent governors looking critically and, and engaging with staff at a local level. They brought a, a business perspective and a community perspective and, and a youth perspective and a minority ethnic perspective to bear on work that uh, we had not really been able to, to bring to the same extent. It also opened quite clearly funding routes. So we were able as a charity to get access to charitable funds that the local authority would not have got. And so I'm just looking at the kind of pie chart of the funding. So 
uh, fees and charges have gone up, facility hire has gone up, sales of goods have gone up, online sales, uh, contracting with other third parties, partnerships and contracts with health and uh, external funding from charities. That whole cocktail has meant that we've doubled the level of funding available from that which was in place at the time when the scale was created. So we've been able to double the independent or the, the, the percentage of our expenditure that comes from independent sources. So in that sense, um, if you take that as a simple metrics, it, it has been a productive model for us. Just off the back of that, are you, do, does anyone in the panel have any concerns about the high levels of reliance on national lottery funding? Because I appreciate that's a big chunk of Creative Scotland's budget, but it also uh, funds many smaller projects in different ways via different funds. Um, it seems to me that we've become culturally very reliant on that as a mechanism and we can't rely on always being there or indeed the levels of funding available currently to always be there in the future. So uh, I know other countries have dealt with this in different ways, but how do you think we could future-proof that our, our resilience towards not, not relying simply on you know, sort of gambling lottery funding as a means of supporting culture and the arts? Yeah, it's a, massive, it's a massive question, and I think probably we are all worried about it, and I don't actually know what the answer is, because you, because we're so embedded in the current model, and it's obviously changing as we speak, and we're kind of seeing the, and actually there's some organisations, though, that are benefiting from the, the changes. For example, Edinburgh International Book Festival's got a really good relationship with Postcode Lottery. You know, across Renfrewshire, there's phenomenal relationships with the big, the big lottery that are kind of long-term, but um, going forward, I think it is cha it's really challenging, and I don't, I don't know what the answer is around it, to be honest. I think I'd be looking to other other people who are kind of expert in this to be kind of helping us find ways through that, as well as the answers coming from within the kind of cultural sector and local government. Yeah. I, I think we're concerned. I don't, yeah. know, I don't know what the answer is. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I shouldn't paint that as a positive, only a negative. There are, there are positives too. As you say, po postcode lotteries, the, the, the success of that has enabled new forms of funding to go into places that the other, you know, other funding models didn't. So I'm not necessarily saying it's a negative. But it's no, no, I think uh, we are. I think we're, we're echoing that there's a, it's a, the fluctuations yeah. in it um, and the changes and that people are relying on it for core funding mm. and to do incredibly important work um, of, of huge value is, is worrying. Can I ask something completely different? And that's uh, around back to local, local government. Um, and we talked about looked at some of the statistics uh, around cuts and, and reductions and it's clear there's a, the chart I'm looking at it shows a fairly consistent reduction in funding across local authorities at different levels but one of that you know part of that is around restructuring how they fit culture and arts into uh, their local authority structures and can I just read out a quote that we had uh, in our briefing paper and it says that another byproduct of this reduced funding is that staff are not qualified to support the arts are shoehorned into arts positions as a result of reorganisations. So in other words, if cultural and arts functions are being soaked into other bits of the council and run by people who have no experience in the arts at all, in some cases, um, that's clearly having a detrimental effect on their ability to uh, run art services. So, um, you know, how do, you know, what, what can local authorities do when they really face that stark choice of having to make cuts and reorganise and, you know, am amalgamate posts, for example? Yes. <laughs> I, I, did, yeah. um, I touched earlier about arts development officers and, and cultural coordinators as, as posts that, that have an outward remit, not necessarily for delivering services <coughs> within the council, but are there to support artists, to support the community. I think having been in a local authority and working with local authorities now, they clearly have really complex challenges. But I would personally, and, and Creative Scotland, would advocate for the importance of those roles. As, as, as we've touched on leverage today in a funding sense, but actually leverage in terms of empowering other people and supporting them to do things in their community, having that expertise, having that person that they know they can talk to at the local level is, and, and also selfishly, who Creative Scotland can work with on a local level. We would advocate it's been really, really important and um, can have a significantly positive impact. So um, the need for that expertise is clear. 
Ian, I mean, agree. I think that sounds like a horrible scenario. That that quote is from um, one of the things. So, into, our cult shouldn't go into our alley until 2015. So before that, it was part. It was a sub department as part of education. So actually, the alley development in 2015, it was established in 2003 for sport and leisure, has enabled us to create a visibility and an identity around cultural services within a Renfrewshire context. So there's challenges that uh, Stuart's already mentioned, but the development of specialist staff, we're trying really hard to promote that and to get budget for it. So we've just increased our arts development team within Renfrewshire leisure. Um, it had been probably underinvested in over the years. We're now looking at investing in it because specialist support is really, really important. So the role of the curator, the role of the arts de development officer, the role of the librarian, they're really critical community roles. It's not just about their exp expertise in librarianmanship or whatever, it's about their expertise and how they kind of bring that specific set of skills that they've got into a community in a kind of social setting. Um, and the same with kind of collections and, and curating. So I think that's about us kind of advocating for what those roles bring. And actually the Alio in has enabled us to have an identity and a visibility around that that we didn't have pre-2015. Just the one, if I may, the one comment on that would be if the Alio is not represented in the City Council's management team, then they're not there at the table when other chief officers having a discussion about budget setting or priorities or just influence. And in Dundee's case and in Glasgow's case, and I'm not sure about others, just, I just know those two fairly well, um, they, they are considered and we, we have the role of being part of the City Council management team as well as running the Alio. Um, you can see that tension. The Alio is independent, it's at arm's length. So you, to be there and to be part of that discussion, then to separate yourself to, for the delivery end of the Alio. Is, is, a, is a challenging role, but I think it's if you have an alio model, that's really important. Otherwise, there's no one within the city council, local authority, management team advocating necessarily for investment in culture. Uh, sure. Uh, unless Mr. Cameron can answer one, yeah, one okay. quick question. I appreciate you here to talk about play, place programme, but the graph that struck me the most from our briefing paper was the uh, regular funding organisations. And the chart that shows the 18 to 21 regular funding, you've got at one end of the spectrum, Edinburgh, 41 million uh, pounds, and 11 local authorities was, with a zero in them. Uh, is that because none of them applied or they just haven't been given any funding? It just struck me as quite a, an odd chart. Um, in some cases, um, we didn't receive any applications from particular, um, particular local authorities. Um, so I think that, that you, you agree that graph looks stark. I think I'd make two points on that. I think regular funding is, is not our only opportunity for funding. Um, and, and we do support activity across, um, across Scotland. I think the second um, would also be about where, and, and Stuart's touched on this, the sort of regional approach and actually the national approach of lots of organisations that we fund who work across Scotland. I think it's around 70, 75% work across Scotland. Notwithstanding that that isn't a substitute for local de development work, but um, just to make that um, clear, it's not necessarily where they deliver all their activity. Could I come in really quick? Because we're one of the local authorities that is, is zero on that, because is Renfrewshire, if it's the same graph. Yeah. But, so it's not an entirely... But Renfrewshire, I think, would kind of say that we're really culturally active and that the RFO analysis isn't the only way of seeing what culture's happening across across Scotland. So there's, there's stories that need to be told behind those graphs as well. It could be the aspirations of a couple of our organisations to get regular funding but I think some of them are also kind of have other other ways that they want to kind of run their businesses and that kind of thing, which is just need to be part of the part of the view, even if you're not on that graph. It doesn't mean culture is not happening. Mm. Just one. Thanks. I mean, one final small add on to that is that one of our regularly funded organisations in Dumfries and Galloway, actually, um, the, they receive 75% uh, of their funding comes from non arts non arts council sources, Crepe Scotland sources. So it is really. To, tricky to get an understanding just looking at it through that specific lens and you know the, the national uh, big, big lottery and uh, uh, heritage lottery there's these are all part of the the picture in terms of arts funding thank you very much to all of you for coming uh, to give evidence to us today it's been quite a long session today and uh, but you, you you've done really well so thank you very much for coming and i'll now briefly suspend
and get through it. The next item on our agenda is consideration of a biannual report from the Scottish Government in relation to a range of EU issues. Um, any observations? Um, I've got a couple of issues um, I'd like to obtain further information on. Firstly, on Horizon 2020, I think it would be useful to get further information on the implications for Scottish organisations receiving Horizon 2020 funding in the context of Brexit, particularly because it's very clear from the, uh, the letter that we really punch above our weight in getting these funds. Um, it was uh, almost 12%, which is way above our population share. So obviously there's been so many unanswered questions in terms of a no deal in particular. Um, I think we need more information on that. And secondly, on the 2014 to 2020 European Social Fund programme, I think it would be useful to get further information on the financial impact of the pre-suspension process and of the in principle agreement that has been reached, as I understand it from the letter with the European Commission. That's my observations. I don't know if m members have some other observations. Jamie, sorry, Jamie. Thank you. Mine relates to the update from the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Education on the one plus two languages policy. Just to put on record, thanks for the to, to the uh, Cabinet Secretary for his response. But I did wonder, um, uh, it, to paint a more helpful picture, in his response he indicated that 70% of secondary schools are providing the full entitlement to learn, learning the first additional language from S1 to the end of S3. I presume by that a statistic that means that 30% of secondary schools in Scotland are not providing the full entitlement that they should be. Um, so I just wondered if that's an improvement or if that's a decrease. Be nice to put this into context uh, over the last couple of years, and I think also when he goes on to say, uh, according to the 2018 teacher census, there were 1,288 teachers with modern languages as their main subject. Um, uh, again, to put, give that some context, whether that number is on a trend of going up or down, um, and, and to put those two together uh, and see if that in any way forms a picture as to whether we are making progress or not. I think in, on its lone snapshot doesn't paint a picture. Should. Uh, I think it would be very useful, just following on from that, just to get a, um, some type of breakdown uh, regarding how many of these teachers are EU nationals uh, and if there has been an increase or decrease in EU nationals coming to work in our education system. That's a useful point to put in. Any other points? To keep pressing in terms of any, whether there's any contingencies have been placed in terms of the shared prosperity fund, which doesn't seem to be in sight at any point oh, whatsoever. I know. You know? Yeah. It says it was promised by the Prime Minister on the 5th of December last year that she would go out to consultation before Christmas, Christmas 2018, and you know it's now the end of June and nothing has happened. And there's real issues about the impact of that across a number of sectors, but particularly those that this committee had, uh, deals with. Okay. Yes, sir. That, absolutely, we need to try to get some clarity there because it's just unacceptable for all these uh, organisations who <laughs> worry about their future. And it's it's really quite astonishing that the UK government has failed to um, make any progress on this issue. It seems at all. Mm -hmm. Maybe a bit more of the day job might be useful. Sure. Um, could we perhaps agree that we will write um, to the relevant ministers um, raising all those issues, well, obviously specifically in the languages. Um, in terms of the, the uh, shared prosperity fund, that's really an issue for UK ministers, of course. Um, but perhaps um, it's an opportunity for the committee to, to write to UK ministers again asking for an update. Um, so um, can we agree that myself and uh, the deputy convener will sign off those letters? Okay. Right, thanks. We can now suspend and move into private session. <laughs>